Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Terry Hildebrandt from the Fielding Graduate University. I'm the Director of Evidence-Based Coaching at Fielding. And today we're going to be having a webinar. Um, and today we have Ariel Finch Bernstein, PhD. He has done some excellent research around the uh, race matters in coaching, an examination of coaches' willingness to have difficult conversations with leaders of color. So welcome, Ariel. And we're thrilled to have you. If you wouldn't mind uh, saying a little bit more about yourself as a way of introduction, and then I know you're going to provide a summary of some of your research. Uh, after that, we are gonna open it up for some questions and answer and have a dialogue. Uh, so each of you online be thinking about your questions as uh, we go into this next step. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Bernstein, and, uh, and welcome. Thank you, Terry, I appreciate it. And I am grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, and before I begin, let me just say thank you publicly. Um, Terry, you were very gracious in uh, disseminating my dissertation when I was in recruitment stage. Um, so if not for you, I don't know if we, I would be able to have this conversation tonight. I might still be in uh, kind of uh, data collection and PhD mode. Um, but but what I'm learning very quickly is that it's always good to talk about your dissertation in the past tense. Um, <laughs> Indeed, right? Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. So a little bit about me. I just graduated from um, grad school in this past May. Uh, and I am very excited. I'm actually working right now um, at the National Basketball Association doing leadership development, uh, people analytics, and also diversity and inclusion work there as well. Um, and as a lifelong basketball fan, it's a kind of a, not to be hyperbolic, but it, it's a dream come true to be able to do the type of work that I love for a company that I'm very, very, very proud to say I'm a part of. Um, so yeah, I'm just very excited to be with you all here tonight. Excellent. Well, if you wouldn't mind sharing your slides, sure. let's uh, hear a little bit about your research. Sure. So. Let me pull this up. So, can everyone see that? Yes, it looks great. Looks Perfect. great. Excellent. So, as Terry mentioned, the, the title of my research was Race Matters in Coaching. Um, I was really curious to study the impact of racial dynamics within coaching conversations. Uh, so, my I have a background in, in counseling. Um, and before I kind of got my PhD, I did a master's in counseling. And, and ultimately, when I entered the PhD world, I really gravitated very quickly towards executive coaching. Simultaneously, so that I had gotten really interested in diversity work. Um, and what I noticed is that there's a big gap in the literature around diversity, dy diversity dynamics within coaching conversations. Um, and while there's a lot of research, uh, in other similar helping professions, teachers, physicians, counselors, what have you, looking at cross-racial dynamics, there's none in coaching. Um, so I got really curious to, to kind of look empirically into, um, into that world. So I kind of had two overarching research questions. Um, number one, do coaches provide less constructive feedback to black clients than they do white clients? And number two, do coaches engage in fewer race-based conversations with black clients than, than they do white clients? And really the, the impetus for these two questions or really kind of the overarching kind of theory behind this was I was really curious whether coaches were comfortable having difficult conversations with clients of color, right? So I operationalized difficult conversations in two ways. One, their willingness to give constructive feedback and two, their willingness to talk about issues of race and diversity. Uh, and again, there was very little, there was actually no research within the coaching world that kind of looked at these two things. Um, so I pulled a lot uh, in generating these hypotheses and or these research questions and doing a literature review. I pulled a lot from um, similar disciplines, like I mentioned before. Um, and the research that I uncovered was very discouraging. There was a clear kind of uh, difficulty that a lot of white helping professionals have partnering across race. So I was really curious, how does this play out within coaching? Um, so 
I had two, actually, let me take a step back here. Um, actually, let me walk you through this. So what I did was I uh, recruited executive coaches uh, across the United States. I recruited 139 executive coaches, uh, and they were uh, part of a uh, very reputable uh, coaching certification program, so which is part of the reason why I reached out to Fielding. Um, so a lot of my sample uh, is from, so I don't know who, I don't know exactly who my sample is, but I do know that uh, one of the prerequisites for participating in the survey was that you are a credentialed executive coach. So a lot of these, a lot of my participants came from uh, either Fielding or the Institute of Coaching or ICF or Columbia's uh, coaching certification program. Uh, these are uh, reputable uh, coaches. Um, and people who've gone through some some sort of training. Hey, Ariel, so, there's a quick question in yeah. the chat. Uh, were these coaches of any race or of a specific race? Yeah, it's a great question. So I did not. So I sampled any any coach who chose to participate in the survey in the study. Uh, I intentionally did not um, indicate in any sort of way that we were interested in measuring race. Uh, so, for example, the cover story of the uh, experiment was we're interested in looking at how coaches prepare for coaching conversations. Uh, there was no mention of race. There was no mention, no mention of diversity. So I mentioned that just to say um, not only did I uh, not exclude coaches, but because my kind of uh, the cover story, if you will, of my, of my experiment was race agnostic. Uh, my hope is that I recruited a fairly representative sample of coaches. Uh, that being said, at the end of the study, I certainly asked people to identify uh, their race. Um, and one of the things that I'll, I'm sure we'll get into later is, unfortunately, I, even though I did code for race, I did measure coaches, the, or my coach's race, unfortunately, I didn't really need to. Uh, about a, a, of my 139 coaches, um, only a handful of them identified as coaches of color, uh, which speaks to a larger issue in the coaching community that we need to have more uh, coaches of color who are able to navigate these otherwise tricky conversations. Right. Um, so basically what I did was I created an electronic study um, and I told my participants that uh, they had been recently contracted for an upcoming coaching engagement uh, and that to prepare for the coaching conversation, they would learn information about their client and that they, would, they, they were going to be asked to provide some feedback to him. So uh, every single one of my participants learned they, learned they were going to be working with James Wilson. Uh, James Wilson was a senior project manager at a healthcare company I made up. I gave them information about James and his bio and the, the company for which he worked. Um, I also gave all my participants a snapshot of James's recent, recent 360 scores. Uh, and as you see on the screen, these are the scores that James received. So James was, was scored on a scale of one to 10 on 10 different behavioral dimensions with higher scores indicating higher performance. So everything I just described just now um, was constant for all participants. All participants learned they're working with James Wilson, who was a senior project manager who had these scores. The only thing that differed was that some learned that James was white and some learned that James was black by this photo or by a photo similar to this. So I got really curious. Do people's perceptions of James differ based on his race? Do people's perceptions of those 360 scores differ because of his race? And by extension, do people's intentions for their coaching conversation differ as well? So that's kind of the kind of the overarching uh, kind of theoretical model or frame I was working from in designing the study. Should I should I continue with my hypotheses? Yeah, let's keep going. Great. So I'll come back to these in just a second. Actually, I'll, I'll flag these for our attention now. So I intentionally made two uh, behavioral competencies equally low. I made valuing diversity and pursuing self-development each 4.6 out of 10. Uh, I just kind of want to flag that for your attention now so that 
it'll make more sense later. So that being said, uh, I had four hypotheses. Uh, I, I hypothesized that, uh, that my participants would be uncomfortable, they would struggle to have difficult conversations with their clients of color. Uh, there's a lot in the research that shows that um, we, when partnered across a race, um, whites are very fearful, or can be very fearful, of appearing racist or appear, appearing prejudiced in some sort of way. And as a result, they make decisions that are suboptimal, um, such that they kind of uh, bend over backwards or they pull punches uh, so as not either not to offend or not to come across uh, or not to put themselves in a negative light. So I mentioned that just because those two, or that, that, that kind of concept undergirds my first two hypotheses. I hypothesized that as compared to white clients, black clients would receive more positive perceptions and they would receive more positive perceptions of their performance. And these two hypotheses are similar, but they're different. They're different in the sense that, so hypothesis one, uh, clients of color, uh, would, re would receive more positive perceptions. This is more, this is more about global traits of James, right? I hypothesized that a black James would be seen as warmer, uh, nicer, if you will, uh, than a uh, white James. A black James would be seen as smarter than would a white James. And again, this is in some ways, con it contradicts what we would otherwise normally think because we know that there's a lot of discrimination bias in evaluations and the way in which people of color are treated both in the workplace and in the greater society. The reason why this is kind of contradictory though is again, when it comes to giving feedback, uh, when, it gives to, when, it, when it comes to giving face-to-face -face or even virtual evaluation, whites often kind of pull their punches, they kind of uh, bend over backwards in a way that uh, makes them look in a, makes them, uh, puts them in a positive light. So I hypothesize that people would bend over backwards here and give James more positive perceptions if he were black. Similarly, I uh, surmise that they would give him, give him, uh, or they would assign more positive perceptions of his organizational performance, right? Those 360 scores. So for example, uh, I said, based on these 360 scores, how deserving is James of uh, a mentorship or uh, a promotion or a big project, right? Um, and I, again, hypothesize that uh, black James, if you will, would be seen as more deserving of those rewards. Those are hypotheses one and two. Hypothesis three was that uh, clients of color would receive less constructive feedback than would white clients. Um, and lastly, uh, that black clients would receive fewer diversity-based or race-based inquiries. Um, so I can I can go into my results and, and now. Do you want me to keep going? What would be what would be helpful? Yeah, let's 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 hear what happened. Um, and and so, I, I did have one quick question. Sure. Regarding um, the hypothesis. So so sure. the the conceptual framework here is that the coaches would be cautious um, and, and and in order to make themselves look good, or or not to appear racist. Correct. And I don't I don't know if that was a that. Would, my, I don't know if I would have gone so as, as far to say that that would have been a conscious choice, um, right? We don't even know what is really motivating people's uh, people's actions, but yes, it would be to to put themselves in a good light. Okay. Yeah. So I won't. I'll spare you kind of um, uh, statistics and numbers and and overwhelming data. Um, but what's really interesting is that hypotheses one and two. Uh, did not bear did not bear fruit. Uh, my hypotheses one and two were not supported. I found no differences in how coaches evaluated um, uh, James or James's organizational performance, which was uh, really interesting, right? Like it ran contrary to my hypotheses. Uh, but what was it really interesting for me was that it told me that uh, all things be uh, basically that my coaches saw their saw their Jameses equally, right? Like they saw um, no differences between a, a white James and a black James. It was as if they were looking at the same profile, right? Like they didn't, they didn't really have any differences around how nice or how smart James was or how impressive those 360 scores. It was as if they were looking at fairly 
equivalent profiles. And yet, we did see differences in choices coaches made for the coaching conversation. So let me show you a couple of slides here. And there was a quick question about the number of participants. Uh, yes, 139. Okay. Yeah. So hypothesis three, I hypothesize that black clients would receive less constructive feedback than would white clients. And I kind of operationalize this in that black clients would receive more support, yet less challenge, more praiseworthy feedback, less constructive feedback, right? These are all kind of like your scale on a scale of one to seven. How much do you intend on supporting James? How much do you intend on challenging James? Those kinds of things. And then on, the, on hypothesis 3E, I um, asked them, um, so earlier in, the, earlier in the survey, I had asked my participants to uh, evaluate each of those behavioral dimensions on which he had been scored as either an area of strength or an area of development for James. And then I uh, asked them, well, based on those areas of development and based on those areas of strength, let's hypothetically say that your coaching session is gonna be 60 minutes with James. How much time would you suggest allocating to talking about his areas, areas of strength? And how much time would you recommend allocating to talking about his areas of development? And again, these are the same 360 scores. So you'd assume that we'd spend just as much time talking about areas of strength to, regardless of the, the race of the client. But again, I hypothesize that black clients would receive less time devoted to the areas of devel development, presumably because it would be harder to talk about where James needs to improve if he's black than versus if he's white. And this is where we started to see differences. So the way to just interpret all this is, um, Four of these five hypotheses uh, were supported. So Black James received more support, yet less challenge, less critical feedback, and five fewer minutes devoted to areas of development focused on five fewer minutes focused on his development than did White James, which is obviously very encouraging, right? It suggests that uh, my clients of color were not getting the same developmental opportunity, um, as were the white clients. Uh, so this is kind of the, this is kind of the cornerstone of my, of my study. Um, and unfortunately, I found what I was expecting to find. The last, I'll walk us through this guy. Um, the last um, related hypothesis is I had predicted that coaches would be less likely to discuss issues of diversity with black clients than they would white clients. Um, at, the end of the, at the end of the survey, I uh, in, injected a level of deception. I told my participants that they were going to record a two minute piece of uh, video recorded feedback to James. I said that uh, research shows that the best coaches not just talk about um, uh, uh, what's working well, but also what's not working well. In that, with, in, with that spirit in mind, um, uh, we'd like you to, to pick one area of development that you identified earlier, uh, and for that to be the focus of a two to three minute piece of um, video feedback. Now, I did not actually record people's, um, uh, I, did not, I did not actually record any, any feedback, um, but I wanted to create the pretense that there was actually uh, going to be some sort of recording, right? I wanted I wanted participants to feel like they had skin in the game and that uh, their choice actually carried with it behavioral um, uh, a behavioral component, behavioral consequences. So I created the illusion that there was going to be a, a recording, even though there wasn't going to be. Um, so as a reminder, I intentionally made two dimensions equally low, right? I made valuing diversity and uh, pursuing self development each four point six out of ten. Um, each obviously an area, area of development for James. Uh, my hypothesis was that uh, if you're a coach uh, and you're given, you're assigned to uh, a James Wilson who is white, that valuing diversity 4.6 would jump off the page. You'd say, hey James, that valuing diversity score, that's really problematic. Uh, that's something you should probably work on. Let's talk about that. Whereas if you were given a James Wilson who is black, you might see that 4.6 on valuing diversity, 
but you might you might be more likely to stop yourself and say, "Ooh, I'm not sure I want to have that conversation with James. I'm not sure that conversation would go well. I might put my foot in my mouth. I might not know what to say to him. Let me talk about something else instead." So that was kind of the the overarching hypothesis. And again, unfortunately, um, my hypothesis um, was borne out. So the way to read this is that uh, white clients were twice as likely to receive valuing diversity feedback, valuing diversity feedback, than were black clients. Uh, which again is really troublesome because it suggests that uh, we know that the uh, experience uh, for uh, uh, executives of color uh, in, in the workplace is fundamentally harder um, and more uh, problematic than the experience that a white executive is likely to face in his or her career. Um, so if, uh, if clients of color are not able to bring issues of, um, issue, uh, if they're not able to bring the impact of race dynamics um, to a coaching conversation, it suggests that they're, they have to check a part of themselves at the door, um, which is really, really, really uh, concerning. Um, so for me, one of the overarching takeaways is, um, you know, like part of me feels like because there was no research on this uh, before, I'm in an exciting place where I get to talk about this really important um, gap, not just in the, in the literature, but in the coaching practitioner community. Um, so I'm trying to, to um, spread the word and, and to try to get the, the word out so that the coaching community pays greater attention to the impact of diversity dynamics within coaching conversations. Excellent. Ariel, any, any other slides or are you ready for questions? I have, I have slides, but I'm, I'm also ready for questions. All right, well, let's take a, a pause at this point. Um, and I, I see someone has went ahead and put a question in and, Michelle, would you like to come online and ask your question and join the conversation? Sure, hi, it's Michelle. And I'm not gonna put on my video because I'm on the East Coast, I'm actually laying in bed. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but my question was really about how you, um, cause you're attributing the coach's choice to the race of the client, but I'm wondering if other things like the coach's level of experience, their style might impact or moderate their choices and how they coach a client and how you accounted for that? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I tried to collect as much data about my coaches as possible. So I, I measured uh, not just their, 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 their own social identity, their own race, but also their gender, their age, um, how many years of coaching experience they had, uh, how, many, uh, how many clients they've had who are of a different race than they are, um, what were their working theories or models from which they they approached their work? Um, and what was really interesting was that I did not find any sort of confounding variable. I didn't find any sort of difference between um, a coach's age, for example, um, or their gender or their coaching style um, that had any sort of moderating impact on the results, um, which is which is uh you know just and honestly it's discouraging um what's interesting is that so i uh so what the prerequisite was that for for, for participation was um coaches had to either be a graduate from a, a an executive coaching program or they had to be currently enrolled and that was they had to be one or the other um and what i found was so among other things, I didn't, I didn't mention this in my slides, but one of the other things I measured was I asked my coaches, how comfortable would you be, uh, how, I, I just explicitly asked them, how comfortable would you be talking about um, issues of diversity with your client? Um, I masked it because I asked, I asked other questions embedded in there. I, I asked them, how comfortable we, would you be talking about any of these behavioral dimensions? Um, but really I was only interested in the, the diversity one. Um, and I mentioned that because uh, what was interesting was that coaches who had graduated from certification program already 
indicated they were more comfortable talking about issues of diversity um, than were the coaches who were still enrolled in a coaching program, right? It was as if that, this is, this is how I've interpreted it. Uh, I'd be curious if you have a different interpretation, but the way I interpret it is, uh, there's something about having gone through, having completed an executive coaching program that gave people confidence in tackling diff potentially difficult conversations. It, it allowed them to have some self-efficacy around the work, uh, which is why you, why we'd see a difference between self-reported comfort in having these conversations. Uh, but what's curious and, and disappointing was that when it actually, when the rubber met the road, when we actually looked at what choices coaches made, we didn't see a difference. Right? There was no difference between um, whether a, a seasoned coach or a, a more junior coach was comfortable talking about issues of diversity. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, Ira, did you ask questions about um, experience with training on diversity for the coaches? Was that one of the demographic variables? At, at <coughs> whether they'd ever received some sort of explicit diversity within coaching training? Yes. That's a good question. I did not ask that question. Um, and looking back, I probably should have. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the only reason I'm asking is we have made efforts, at least at Fielding, to include issues of diversity in our training programs. Mm -hmm. So my, my theory is if, if the more training you've had, the more comfortable you might be bringing it up um, with people of color that you might be coaching. Um, but, you know, uh, that I'm just kind of curious if that showed up, uh, might be a good next step. Yeah. 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 Um, that's a, that's an interesting point. Um, and, and I love that they're, I love that you're, that fielding is focusing on kind of the impact of, of diversity in coaching. And I, and I wish that, more programs would embed it into their curriculum. Great. Any other questions from the audience? And you're welcome to unmute yourself and come online. Yeah, this is uh, Nicole. Sorry, if you can't hear me, let me know if you can. Nicole. Yeah, walking. Nicole, <laughs> we hear you, Nicole. You're okay. good. So I'm just curious because I'm um, really familiar with the Hogan assessment tool. And one of the Hogan assessment um, indicators is actually um, an item on what they call tradition. So in other words, is your values really more, are your values really aligned more with um, keeping tradition? And when you're low on tradition, sometimes that can show up as somebody who has a high value for diversity. So what I'm curious about is um, because you're basically asking folks, would they actually give feedback on whether or not this individual values diversity? Is it potentially because the coach could be high on tradition, for example, or presumes that their client may be high on tradition? Yeah. So I guess question. I'm just wondering about like how, how we're presuming that people should be valuing. Hmm. diversity as part of it. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've, I've given this, this, this talk in, in several different forms. Um, I've never heard this connected to the Hogan. So I appreciate that. That's really interesting. Um, my, yeah, like I, I, if I were, if I were going through another PhD program, if I were getting another PhD, I would definitely want to connect this in some sort of way. Uh, to people's Hogan scores. That's really interesting. Um, so my thought is, my thought is, th it's possible, right, that that it was uh, someone's uh, tradition score that some sort of, uh, in some sort of uh, impacted the results in some way that we can't really see or measure. Um, there's a part of me that also says, doesn't really matter why coaches are not having these conversations. It, it doesn't really matter why coaches were reluctant to have a diversity-based conversation with a client of color. Like to me, it's like we can have a conversation as to why that is, but what's most important is that they're not, right? And, and the question is, the, for me, the focus is helping coaches get to a place where 
we're not imposing our own agenda or our own worldview, our own kind of perspective on what is discussed and what is not discussed in coaching, but more of putting our client's agenda ahead of anything else and saying, okay, what would be best for my client to talk about? How can I best understand my client so that we're going to have a helpful conversation for him or her? So Ariel, I have a follow-up question. Um, I'm just curious what you think might be good interventions to support coaches being more comfortable having these kind of constructive conversations with people of color? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think the first that, so I'd say there, there, there's a couple things that come to mind. One is there's a part of me that wants to, for people to be more aware uh, of, of what's going on, right? Like my sense is that uh, in some ways, the, a lot of the coaching community doesn't know what they don't know. Um, so my hope is that this, either my work or similar work gets traction in the coaching community and we start paying attention to it because in, until we start make, paying attention to this and it becomes a priority and it becomes a focal point for uh, uh, certification programs and uh, credentialing bodies across, really across the world, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to be confident or optimistic that change is going to happen, right? So part of it is just people need to be more aware of it. Um, I think a lot of it is what uh, you're doing in your coaching program and, and helping people, uh, not to train people not just on having diversity awareness, but having diversity skills. Um, so what's interesting is that I didn't measure, I didn't actually measure the type of feedback that people gave. I didn't measure um, the the diversity conversation, right? Like I didn't actually have them record feedback and I didn't, I didn't analyze that data. Um, I mentioned that because I, 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 what I did measure was I measured people's choice to have a conversation. I didn't measure the quality of the conversation, right? So it's possible that a coach is willing to opt into a conversation, but it's a whole other thing of who knows how effective or helpful that conversation would be. Um, so for me, it's, it's putting this on coaches' radars, number one, but number two, helping them build the skill sets to actually navigate a, a, a complex terrain. There's, there's a literature that comes from the education space it has looked a lot at uh, how whites can partner effectively with minorities. Um, because it's, it's from, a, from a similar perspective, a, feedback is really difficult in an educational context across race because it can be really easily interpreted that if I'm a white person and I give feedback to uh, a student of color, uh, if that feedback is particularly harsh uh, or particularly critical, it might be seen as critical because I am racist or I'm prejudiced or I'm holding them to unrealistically high standards, right? It can also be misinterpreted if I give feedback that is particularly lenient, right? It might be seen as, um, Right, so similar to what I was saying before about bending over backwards, it might be seen that if I give lenient feedback or even uh, soft feedback to a client, a student of color, it might be seen as I'm giving you this uh, gentle feedback because I don't want to ruffle feathers, I don't want to have a hard conversation. So it speaks to this tricky dynamic of oftentimes a, a feedback across race, um, it's hard for a student of color to take it in and actually hear the feedback regardless of whether it's positive or negative. Um, I mention all this to say one of the interventions they've come across is something they call the WISE intervention, W-I-S-E. Um, a WISE intervention is basically, it, it holds the tension between providing both support and challenge. It says, uh, I'm gonna give you this really hard feedback, right? I'm gonna be cri like, particularly critical with you on this feedback and I believe that you can make these changes effectively, right? It's like holding people, give it's the challenge piece and also providing the assurance that I think you can get better at this. Um, what's interesting is that like, I, we know that the best predictor of whether or not a coaching engagement is gonna be successful is whether or not the client feels like there's trust in the relationship. Um, and that too is the kind of the underlying principle 
between a wise intervention or within a wise intervention, right? Kind of the, what separates uh, a student of color's ability to hear and take in feedback is whether or not they trust the feedback provider. So to me, it's like, how do we, how do we make sure we have trust between a white coach and a client of color? Uh, if there's trust in place, it makes it more likely that the feedback will actually be uh, not just authentically delivered, but also received in a way that is heard and is ultimately helpful. Interesting. So we have two more questions uh, from our audience today. Olivia, would you like to ask your question? Uh, hello? Yes, we hear you. Hello. Okay. Um, do you think that the um, coaches may have thought that diversity just meant race and didn't take into consideration uh, gender, sexual orientation, or religion? It's certainly possible. Um, if that were the case, though, you'd expect that there'd be, um, there'd be no differences on uh, between a, a white client and a black client, right? Like, there's no reason to believe that um, uh, the we see any, the, really the only differences between the clients were race, right? So it's easy to say, it's easy to come to the conclusion that any differences we see in how coaches acted towards those clients, the only thing that's different between them is race, easy to say, well, probably what is driving the differences that we see, right? Like, if religion is impacting coaches, it's probably impacting coaches who are assigned a white client just as much as it would impact coaches who are assigned a black client. Um, so it, it's possible, but it's also not likely that uh, religious identity or any other, uh, let's say, sexual identity would have any sort of differential impact on one client versus the other. Okay, we also have a question from Dr. Patrice. Yes, good evening. Um, wanted to know um, if the uh, the notion of implicit bias of the coaches were explored in terms of having difficult conversations, um, or is that maybe a future line of res research to consider? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I actually assumed I was going to see some sort of implicit bias, right? So uh, my first high two hypotheses were that uh, uh, James, uh, James who is black would be seen as more, would be seen as nicer and smarter uh, and would um, uh, be, be, be seen as more deserving of rewards. And not necessarily that this would be a conscious choice, right? People wouldn't necessarily say, I think uh, a black James Wilson is, is smarter than a white James Wilson. It wouldn't be as, as cut and dry as that. But there'd be some sort of um, uh, bias in place that would, that would drive those, the, the, those, those survey responses. And as, as I mentioned before, that's not what I found, right? Like I didn't see any sort of implicit bias in evaluating James. They, they evaluated James equivalently. Uh, where we did see different though was in coach's behavior. Uh, so to me, this, is, this indicates that we didn't see implicit bias, but what, what we saw was what the literature refers to as uh, racial anxiety, just the, the anxiety that was likely induced for coaches having a conversation or connecting in some sort of way with someone of a different race, particularly white coaches working with, um, with black clients. Uh, I was really interested in thinking about, so I had a moderating variable for the, the study that didn't bear fruit, so I didn't talk about it tonight, but one of the, the moderating variables that I was really interested in thinking about uh, was uh, implicit bias and actually giving uh, participants an implicit association test, which is kind of a, an automatic way to test people's implicit bias. Uh, I would have wanted to just for mechanical reasons, it became complex and complicated, uh, but it is an interesting question. I, I am curious whether we would see differences in scores across people who have either high or moderate or low levels of implicit bias. Okay. We also have a question from George. Thank you. It's actually Georg. Um, did you normalize the results against the uh, bias that exists for the for having or against having that diversity conversation in the first place? 
because you have the right you have the skewing on the with the white client and the black client that the diversity conversation is had, is had less right it's less pronounced in the white client and if you normalize for that i would love to see because i have a sense that if you call it racism that is basically an amplification of that bias already not to have the diversity conversation can you that's interesting. Can you explain your question a little? Can you say more about that? I'm, I'm not fully grasping what you're saying, but I'm intrigued. So <clears throat> when you look at, when you go back one slide and you look at the, um, the two graphs, right, they show you with the white client and the black client that the um, conversation around the uh, behavioral competency uh -huh. was preferred to be had with both clients, right? Uh-huh. So there is a bias, no matter if you, even if you take the gender at the race out of not having the diversity conversation gotcha. so if you normalize for that, that would be interesting because that would show the amplification that the race gives you. Correct. Right. So, um, yeah, it's a good point. So basically uh, I, I intentionally made valuing diversity and pursuing self-development each 4.6 out of 10, um, to make them obvious uh, be, uh, feedback conversations, right? Um, but I asked them among any area of development you identified, which one is gonna be the focus. So while the most common topics were valuing diversity and pursuing self-development, other people chose different behavioral dimensions that were also seen as low, even if they weren't as low, they saw them as areas of development, uh, which is why we see 63% of people with a white James and 81% of people with a black James uh, talking about something other than air, uh, valuing diversity because they could have chosen theoretically any of the other nine. Um, but your point's a good one in that what if the, the choice were binary, right? Like what if, what if it was one or the other, we might see even more, uh, uh, we'd even, we might even see a larger disparity here. Yeah, that's the idea. Thank you. Okay, Michelle, would you like to come back online? Sure. Okay, so you mentioned having a small number of non-white coaches. So I was curious how many you ended up with. And based on that, did your study happen to reveal any insights when a coach of color worked with the black client? Yeah, so I had uh, four coaches who identified as black. Uh, I looked at their data, um, but ultimately I did not include them within my sample. And the reason why is uh, it's very common in interracial feedback research uh, to not look at, to not include uh, participants who identify as black. And the reason why is because um, we obviously will never know how someone uh, uh, would, what they would do or not do in a coaching conversation. But presumably the hypotheses that I hold around a willingness to have difficult conversations um, I wouldn't necessarily have the same hypotheses for a, a black coach working with a black client as I would a white coach with a black client. Um, so I looked at the data, but I ultimately removed it as is typically done in these types of studies. But to your question more specifically, uh, I found much less, in fact, I found no uh, differences between how a um, black coach interacted with a black client versus when they interacted with a white client. I will say that it's hard to interpret, it's hard to interpret the data when the sample size is only four people, right? Like it's, it's hard to, to really say anything with confidence as to why, as to whether those numbers actually hold any weight. The one thing that did strike me though is that uh, three of the four coaches who identified as black um, talked, chose to talk about buying diversity irrespective of who their client was, right? For them, it was buying diversity 4.6, regardless of whether James is white or black, we're gonna, we should be talking about that. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's an interesting, uh, I don't even say finding, I would say it's just an observation. Um, but one of, the, one of the kind of overarching implications for, for study I think is um, not just do we need to you know increase the diversity intelligence the DQ if you will of coaches 
ability, ability to partner across race. Um, but also, we need to increase the number of um, executive culture, coaches of color we have in the community, right? Like, I think at some point, uh, we can provide all the awareness, we can provide all the skills training we, we can, but at some point, I think there's value in saying, we need to meet our coaches where they are. Uh, we know that we're operating within the larger confines of a, at least in the U.S., a, a, a society where race relations are really fraught and really complex. Um, and if we're really trying to hold our clients' interests in mind, if our clients are our priority, we need to pe we need to put people in the room with them who are able to offer the the space that they need. Uh, so for me, it's like. Yes, we need to do. We need to work on our coaches, period. And we need to get more coaches of color um, in the community. We need to increase the pipeline because my sense is that uh, they're the they're the people that that are best able to have these conversations in the first place. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, this is Marion. Um, we hear we hear you. Um, you mentioned um, about the client driving the agenda. However, in presenting your research, it seems to imply that the topic of diversity was driven more by the coach. That the coach was the one bringing up the topic. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yeah, so I asked my um, coaches, uh, you know, among the area areas of development you identified, which one would you want to talk about? Which one would you do you feel like would be most helpful to James? Um, and I gave them an option of NA. I would not give any feedback to James. Like I would opt out of this. Um, and some people did, but they were a very small minority. Um, so most coaches. Uh, opted into the conversation, which is interesting, right? Because if you think about, that was obviously a, a coaching philosophy that sessions should be client driven and that they, uh, they should set the agenda and co a coach is there just to kind of facilitate and to hold the frame. Um, that being said, it's interesting that coaches, when given the opportunity to, to not give feedback, they forewent that opportunity. They, 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 decided to engage, um, which is interesting because I know that there's a big philosophical debate about ultimately what is the role of a coach. And, and Ariel, just to clarify, you were providing the, as a setup uh, for the question, you were giving on 360 data. So, so that the coach was essentially interpreting the 360 data as part of the coaching engagement in this case. Correct, yeah, sorry if I didn't make that clear. But we may have had some people join late, so I just uh, want to clarify that. Gotcha. It would be interesting to see the scenario if the if the topic was coming from the from the client. Was what do you what do you have in mind? Tell me more about that. No, I'm just envisioning a typical coaching conversation, mm -hmm. and um, you know, if you're coaching a person of color, um, how likely are they to bring up the issue of diversity in a coaching conversation. Right, right. Yeah, and it's a good question. Um, to me, I mean, the, I'd be curious if what your all thoughts are, but my, the first place I go is, it depends upon how much they trust their coach, right? It depends upon how much they value that relationship. It depends upon how much confidence they have in their coach to be able to navigate that conversation. Um, so it clearly there's a lot of work to be done in this space, um, but it's a, it's a really good question. Hi, this is Pearl. Can you hear me? I can. So I, I just had a reaction to the question, um, from Marion, uh, and I happen to be a diversity and inclusion practitioner and a coach and it comes up as clients talk through various scenarios in the workplace 
we're in now with the current demographic makeup of people, a variety of diversity related topics come up it, when you're talking about um, scenarios, especially people driven scenarios, um, more so than technical competence, but it happens all the time when it comes up. Uh, when it comes up most is in relational challenges and conflict management and issues of that nature. So I just thought I'd mention that since you asked, I think it's a great question. And I love this research, Ariel, by the way, and um, it's brilliant. And I plan to uh, share it with others. Thank you, I appreciate that. We probably have time for at least two more questions. Anyone else? I'd like to uh, join the conversation. What got you originally interested in that research? Oh, you're asking very little time to spare. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll give you the very high level. Um, so I am, uh, I'm white, uh, I am straight, I am a male. Uh, I spent much of my formative years not thinking about diversity, not thinking about social justice. I, I grew up in a relatively affluent area in San Diego uh, where most of the people around me were white. Um, so it wasn't that I was uh, uninterested in race. I just, I was, I, it wasn't part of my purview. Like I didn't think about it. Um, and that changed when I moved to New York. It was the first time I had been around um, not just diversity, but really exposed to it, right? Because in San Diego, which is where I grew up, even if people look different than each other, everyone drives everywhere. So you're just not exposed to it in the same way you are in New York, where you know every single person takes a subway. Every single person walks the city. So you... you you see it, you feel it in a different way. You cross from uh, one street to the next and immediately the neighborhood changes. And you see some neighborhoods have really good access to uh, resources and some don't, right? And it changes like that. And it got me really interested in thinking about who has access, who has privilege, um, the whole thing. And simultaneous to that, I, uh, so I moved to New York to do a master's program in counseling psychology, and I got really interested in, in social justice and inclusion work. Uh, and I actually said, you know what, I want to I study this. I'm really curious about this. It feels like as a white person, I will never know what it feels entirely. I will never know what it feels to be a person of color. And I found that really, I feel like that has really inspired a lot of curiosity in me. I feel like it, it kind of made me um, uh, really want to pursue it empirically, right? Like if I can't experience it myself, I want to study this. I want to read about this. I want to think about this in a way that's going to help me understand it better. Uh, so I shifted, when I shifted from uh, a master's in counseling to a PhD in organizational psychology, it was very easy to shift from counseling to coaching, right? I didn't even know what coaching was until I started my, my PhD work. Um, so I was really interested in coaching immediately, and I'd also walked into the program with this really big curiosity with doing diversity work. I didn't know to what end, but I knew that was one of the things that drew me to the program in the first place. Uh, so it was a combination of becoming really interested in coaching, wanting to do, to do diversity work, and then very quickly learning there's no research, or there had been no research, that kind of looks at the intersection of those two things. Uh, so that was kind of the impetus, or the origin story, if you will, of, of the study. And, and what's really exciting for me is that uh, even though I'm not, uh, and I'm no longer in academia, I'm still teaching, but I'm not as an, as an adjunct, but not um, as a full-time professor and I'm out uh, in industry. What's exciting for me is I'm thinking about, okay, well, what's the, what are the practical implications of this? Not just in coaching, but um, between a manager and his or her direct report, um, so what's really exciting for me is I get to do similar diversity inclusion work at the NBA, a company that really prides itself on being inclusive, 
um, you know, one of the one of the things I did not mention in our conversation, so I'll mention it here, is that and among the other demographic questions that I asked my coaches, I asked them, you know, besides being a coach, how else you do I identify? And uh, almost all of them identified as either a, a leader or a manager. So it made me, re it's one of the kind of the, uh, my takeaways was, well, if we're seeing these, this, these interracial dynamics play out in coaching conversations, what's to say they're not also happening at a day-to-day -day, day -day level within an organization, right? In a one-on-one -on -one between the direct report and his, or between a manager and his or her direct report. Um, so it, to me, this is a much, this is a first step in a much larger conversation of, of helping um, kind of practitioners partner across the racial divide. Cool, thanks for the answer. That's, that's an awesome motivation. Thank you. Well, Ariel, I think, uh, with that question, this is a good stopping point. So uh, again, I just really want to thank you for coming today and presenting to our community of practice at Fielding. And uh, your research clearly is groundbreaking and, and, and fascinating. I think it's, there's a lot more to come and we look forward to uh, our continued partnership uh, uh, going forward. I love uh, it. But thank, you, thank you so much.